You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. But the reality is he'd done what he'd done. But the punishment was going to was going to end his career. The punishment would have ended his career. The punishment would have... He would never have fought in the Europeans. Without fighting in the Europeans, he couldn't have fought in the Olympics, etc., etc. When we're in court, it will be all guns blazing. You know, I'll be on, I'll be putting on a show. You will not think for a moment that I have a single doubt in your innocence. I said, but between these four walls, I am also obliged to tell you the truth. And you are... You, you have no chance. You just don't have any chance of winning this. I was put into a murder in the Old Bailey. It was three and a half months. I was the youngest person in by, I mean, I was 23. We've, we're all being tracked daily. You don't walk more than 30 meters without being recorded on the camera in this country. I had to go and say to him, you've got no defense. You're looking at about 17 years. And I was thinking, how's he gonna react to that? I mean, what, what, how's he gonna react to that news? Pedophilia is a sexuality, it can't be cured. So by its very definition, they are always a danger. Always, that's never changing. And boom, we're on. Excellent. Today's guest, we've got Tony Kent. Tony boy, how are you? Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So, top class barrister. You work with all the biggest cases in the UK, well, more so London, but yep. uh, you're also... No, it's up. pretty much all around, all yeah. around, around the yeah. world. Book author as well. Yep. You've got your fifth book, I believe. We've got four books here. We've got Marks for Death, Killer Intent, Power Play, No Way to Die. Yep. Fiction, partly. All, all completely fiction. Apart, well, the, this one here, the second one, Mark for Death, is uh, that's kind of a what if. That's something that almost happened. And uh, the rest of them completely made up. <clears throat> interestingly, when I, when I first wrote the first one, say interestingly, you can decide that. Uh, when I read the first, what wrote the first one, I gave it to the publishers. And it, there's a cross-examination in there. It's not a legal thriller, but one of the characters is a barrister. And someone always, yeah, they say, write what you know. So I wrote about a barrister and he ended up going off and doing these ridiculous <laughs> things that are nothing like what a barrister does. But when you meet him, he's in a court case. And when I gave the book to the uh, to the publishers, they gave it back and said, we really love the book, but that court case is ridiculous. That would never happen. And I said to them, well, it's actually word for word something that happened three years ago. It's a cross-examination that I did three years ago, word for word. The rest of the book is completely made up. But that one, that, that cross-examination wasn't. And they made me change it. I still had to change it because they said people just won't believe it. Too far-fetched yeah. that people would think it was fake. It's yeah. mad that I just interviewed the kid, Ward Dogs, they made a film about him, um, Gun Runner. Yeah, but he his partner was a nutcase and actually watered it down because people wouldn't believe yeah. the stuff that he actually did. They would think it was fiction, even though some of the stuff in the film they thought yeah. was a lie. But majority was all well. That's, that's with the, with Mark for Death, which is the second one. That is the only one that's, as I said, ostensibly true. It's the only one. Well, it's not true, but it's based on something that might have happened, and it's uh, that's a legal thriller. That the only one of them that's a legal thriller. The rest of them are sort of action, yeah. political sort of Lee Child, Jack mm. Reacher kind of things. That one's about a serial killer in a trial. And the serial killer is based on a real person. 100%. I mean, if the guy ever reads it, God knows what will happen to me. Luckily, he's never coming out. <laughs> but that one, he genuinely, completely based on a real person. And I had to take out probably 70% of the stuff he really did. Uh, and still, when people read it, the only criticism I get is, oh, that guy's a bit unrealistic. He, you know, he, how can he do all those things? And all, this, all you think is... He did a hell of a lot worse than that. He did a hell of a lot more than that. Uh, you've worked some top end cases, like one of the, the high profile ones was Anthony Joshua, where yeah. you've saved his career, no doubt. Like um, he got a not guilty, which we'll touch on. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guest, get a bit of understanding yeah. standing about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Um, I grew up in West London. On a, I grew up in a council estate in West London. Um, I come from a massive Irish family. There's, there's literally hundreds of us. Um, there's well, one occasion years ago, I was walking down the street and some lads are walking towards us. And my mate said hello to them. And, uh, and I didn't because I didn't know who they were. And um, after we got past them, he turned around and said, you're not talking to your cousin Leon. I said, I don't have a cousin Leon. Apparently I do have a cousin Leon. We just walked past him. There's literally a, over a hundred first cousins. <clears throat> my mum was one of 17. So I come from this massive Irish family, all brought up in West London, and I was brought up on a council estate. 
And the reason that I went into what I did, the reason I became a barrister was because my brother, my oldest brother, has been in and out of prison for the uh, last five years. I think he's been quite good. <laughs> but before that, uh, till he was about 45, in and out of prison, 17 years old to 45. And I went to watch him um, when he was on trial once. And it's the only time we ever went to watch him. And the reason we went to watch him was he hadn't done this. He actually was innocent of this one. And the reason we knew that is because the police had lied and pretended they'd found stuff in my mum and dad's house. Now, whatever my brother was, he was shit scared of my mum. <laughs> and so there is no way he'd have had anything in the house. And they were there when the, when the search was carried out. So they know nothing was found. So the police were lying. And on that one occasion, we went to support him. On every other occasion, we knew that he was guilty. And yeah, we were under no illusions about him. But on that one occasion, we went to support him. And I got about 15 minutes into the trial before I completely forgot my brother was there. And I was just completely taken with this barrister and what he was doing. And over three days, before they ever got to a jury, over three days, he had all of the evidence kicked out as inadmissible when he proved every single piece of dishonesty that they pulled. And I remember walking away from that. So I think I was 14 years old, walking away and saying to my mum, that's what I want to do. But when I said that to her, because of where we come from, uh, she said, that's great, really good. That's a good, a good ambition to have. Don't tell anyone because they're going to laugh at you. Because back then we just imagined you know, being a barrister was like trying to become Pope. It's just, it wasn't for people from our background. How were you at school, Tony? Like, especially if your brother's kind of in that life of crime and for you not to go down the same path as him. Like, how were you? Did you see yourself slipping to go down? It's not like you say, it's not to put people down, but did you know I don't want that life when you watched him? I did. I hesitate to say that in any forum that he might see because he will take that as credit and he'll start telling me that I owe him because he's just that kind of character. <laughs> but, but yeah, I did. I, did. I, I saw that. Um, I saw that as the thing you know, that wasn't the way to go. To. A, a big part of it, several things, a big part of it was I just didn't want to do that to my mum. You know, I saw how much that destroyed her. I was five years younger than him. Uh, we've got a brother in between and we've got some behind. But um, but I watched that and I was just at the right age to not want someone to upset my mum. And actually, I think that my, yeah, the, the, the way I reacted to that barrister was, I think, probably about my mum as well. It was probably you know, the way she'd reacted to him and how grateful she was. And it's almost like a superhero coming in and saving her son. And so, yeah, that was a big part of it. Uh, I was quite bright. I was... I, I did quite well without trying. Um, we, we, I did spend quite a lot of my, um, of my what should have been GCSE years pushing tarmac wheelbarrows and climbing up ladders and doing roofing and all that stuff because it was expected in our family that we would finish school at 15, 16, go off and work for dad or work with dad or work for dad and we'd all learn to be builders, which is what the rest of the family did. And that was fully what I intended to do. And then I got my GCSEs and they were quite good without really trying. And it was at that point that I thought, maybe I should give this a go. Maybe I should try. So then I did my A-levels and ended up not trying that hard again, but trying a bit harder. I did very well at the A-levels. And at which point I got to 18 and mum said, yeah, maybe you should do that barrister thing, give it a go. Because you know, if you're getting to this point without doing, without much effort, then a bit of effort might, might make all the difference. So that was a big factor. I was lucky that I was bright. I mean, it's just it's pure luck. That's why I don't mind saying it, because otherwise it sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? But, was, um, but I was just lucky that way. And boxing. Boxing was a huge part of it. I'm a big believer that if you can give kids a direction, then that's great. If you can give kids a direction that outlets all the testosterone that's teeming through you when you're growing up and being a teenager, that's even better. So I look at my oldest brother. He went the way he went. I look at my next eldest brother and you think he didn't do the same things. He learned some lessons from, from his older brother, but at the same time, still didn't go where he would probably want to have gone now when you're looking back. And I just think the difference between us was boxing because while they were out on the streets and you know, in pubs and fighting in pubs and doing all these different things, I was in a boxing club and I was training. And I think that gave me a direction that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Yeah, I think that's important for kids is mm. to have learn some sort of combat, whether it's yeah. boxing, karate, mixed martial arts, or whatever it is. To it keeps you. I don't know. You've got to learn. You got to learn at, when you when you speak to the people I've spoke to. You tend to a lot of their lives pathed out with their younger years, <laughs> and I think having some sort of combat skills teaches you not to be. Well, I wouldn't say be a man, but it just gives you an extra bit of purpose. Yeah, you're okay. Like a lot of people. 
the angriest people I know is because it's they're scared. Yeah. They're scared. I believe anyway it's because they're scared. What's the steps to be become a barrister? What do you need to do? Um, the, when I did it, they've, they've changed it ever so slightly now, but when I did it, it was, uh, you went to university, which I went to Scott, I was saying earlier, I went to Dundee University, uh, where they teach English law, weirdly, even though Scottish law and English law is completely different. Um, I went to university at Dundee, did four years at university. Then you come down, you go to what we used to call bar school. Uh, I think they still call it that, but the qualifications have got a different name. Um, bar school is, in my opinion, a complete and utter waste of time. Uh, because then you go off and you do pupillage and pupillage is basically an apprenticeship and that's where you learn your job. So you learn a lot of the law theoretically and <clears throat> the surrounding things at university. You go to bar school and you get taught by a, a fair number of failed barristers how to probably not do your job properly. Could explain why they're now teaching in bar school and I'll be in, I'll be in trouble for saying that, but I'm sorry it's true. I gave up bar school. At, uh, I started in October. I stopped going at Christmas because they just they were teaching us crap and we had all the books and so I just said, you know what, I'm going to go and earn some money, pay for this shit and I'll, um, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll, I'll teach myself, which is what I did. Um, and then after that, you go to the thing that matters, as I say, which is the apprenticeship stage, which is pupillage. That lasts a year. The first half of it, the first six months, you follow a particular barrister. I was extremely lucky with the barrister I was given, my pupil master, for a number of reasons. He's exceptionally good. We got on exceptionally well. He's still my best mate, um, even now, 20 years down the line. Uh, we're actually in a trial together. I'm, I'll be seeing him in about an hour and a half back in Reading. Um, and more than anything, is my mind works in a very particular way, which isn't quite how most barristers work. And so does his. So just by pure fluke, that there's maybe sort of ten percent of barristers who work who work, work a little bit differently to others, and he happens to be one of them, and happens to be one of the best of them. And I was lucky enough to get him, follow him around for six months, and learn, and see that actually all those weird ideas that I was having about cases, I wasn't alone. And you can you can apply things and look at things in a certain way, and then go on and do it successfully. So I learned from him, but I I was very lucky because because I'd come from the council estate. I'd gone to Dundee, not even English, to do English law. Um, everything I did was, was outwardly wrong, really. And I thought, you know, as we all think, I thought, well, the bar is all about Eton. It's all about Harrow. It's all about very, very, and Oxbridge. And none of the top places are going to want me, um, i.e. the top chambers. And so I didn't apply to any of the top chambers. Back then, after that, you had chambers like Matrix and, you know, they, they got... They got names now, but they didn't have names back then. Back then, they all had an address. So where they were based was the name of the chambers. Top chambers were three hair court. So I thought, not applying to them. Red Lion Court didn't apply to them, a few others. But three hair court was Man United, as was. And I didn't apply to them because they would never consider me. I applied to Two Bedford Row. I got an interview at Two Bedford Row. I turned up to the Two Bedford Row interview thinking, I've never heard of these guys. So who really cares? And breezed the interview completely. You know, it's as relaxed as we are now, rather than all nervous because I'm talking to Man United. And it turned out that they were three hair court and they just moved and I didn't know. So I'd applied to the very, very top set in the country uh, by pure fluke because they had moved the dress about six months earlier and I wasn't up on my research. <laughs> so, I, And they took me on. And I ended up going there, doing my pupillage there. I spent um, a, a, the pupillage last a year. They then took me on. And I spent 12 years there before moving on and doing my own thing. But, 12 years? So Scotland... Yeah. I think law school and I think seven years. I think you've got lawyers. I think you've got yeah. QCs, mm. uh, ju judges, lords. Like, what's the difference with like, barristers in England? What's the difference between English We and make Scotland? the split much earlier. Um, in Scotland, everyone becomes a solicitor. Um, well, not everyone, every lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> not just everyone down the road. But everyone becomes a solicitor. And then the, the ones who are more inclined towards trialing, the ones who are more inclined towards either a particular specialism or being an advocate will then qualify as an advocate, but that comes later. Over here, we're more of the kind of GP surgeon route. So a, a solicitor will normally be a, a, a master, well, jack of all trades. And these days, much more, they become a master of one in a way they didn't used to. 
But it used to be that generally they would be a bit of a jack of all trades. They, they, you'd go to a solicitor, they could do your conveyancing, they could do your personal injury, they could do your trespass, they could do your crime. It's not quite as simple as that now, but it, that's how it was for generations and generations. A barrister is a complete specialist. Uh, they specialize in their area of law. If their area of law is crime like mine, then they're also a specialist advocate. So I'm a jury lawyer. My job is to stand up and talk to juries. Uh, it's also to stand up and talk to judges. I'm better at the juries than I am at the judges. <laughs> um, with some lawyers would be completely the opposite of that. So it's really, the distinction is basically surgeon GP. Yeah, you go to a solicitor with your problem. If it's a problem up to a certain point, they will solve your problem. Once it goes beyond that point, they will refer you to the surgeon, which is the barrister, to then, to then deal with the more serious, more acute problem. What was it like doing your first case, your first trial? Um, the first trial I did is not the first trial I prepared for. Uh, the first trial I prepared for was on my very first day. So I did my six months following Craig, Craig, the pupil master around. And then um, on the Monday morning, I was supposed to be in court to represent some guy for, uh, for jumping the barriers at, where was he? St um, Stratford, Stratford Station as was. And to, for a guy... <laughs> I just um, I just watched Craig defending major criminals for six months, major criminals, major crime, murder, everything. And my first case, I found myself preparing more than I would see him prepare for one of those because you just get into this rabbit hole of I've got to be ultra prepared, which is a huge mistake. Um, I prepped that, got to court, guy turns up, that's not me. I said, well, what do you mean that's not you? That fella's in his 50s. I said, yeah. So well, I'm only 23. Said, no, you're not. You're 55. I'm 23, mate. And it turns out over the course of the next couple of minutes that he's completely fucking insane, completely mad. So my first, what should have been my first trial, became with my first having someone sectioned for his own for his own safety because he was in, he'd gone to a point and it just tipped over the edge at some point before the trial, whether it was the day before, whether it was a month before, he was now dangerous to himself and to others. So the first trial that I should have done, I ended up with a guy being sectioned. The first trial that I did do, I can't remember it. I'll be honest, why? But my first three or my first three or four trials, I am massively overprepared, all of them, which is not my way. I'm not a big. I obviously prepare, but I'm not an overpreparer. I'm not an intricate preparer the way some people are. I. I react, I'm much more reactive instinctive. And that's, that's what I mean about the 10% of barristers who work a bit differently. I'm much more reactive, much more instinctive naturally. But I suppressed that and over-prepared everything. And I, and I screwed them all up, one after the other, after the other. I was just terrible in all of them because it just wasn't for me. And then I was in chambers over-preparing, I think my sixth one, when my pupil master um, walked in. And he saw what I was doing. And he saw how much I was writing. And he saw how much I'd written. And he said, right, leave all that there. We're going to the pub. And we went to the pub. And he got me completely and utterly wasted. Completely. But to the extent I woke up on his living room floor at about half six the following morning in my suit. And I had to be in court at nine. And I'd done nothing apart from that stuff the night before, which wasn't, you know, I, I was over preparing so much that all that work was on one witness out of six. And I then went to court. It was city magistrates in bank. I went to court, had to do it off the cuff, had to do it instinctively, won the case and realized, ah, that's where I've been going wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, in my mind, that's my first case. But I know I lost six before that. <laughs> so it's important to not go in raw, but not going too prepared where... Yeah, for it's me. Like, it's like me doing interviews as well. Like I don't have questions. Mm. I feel as if I've tried having questions there and it kind of throws off. Yeah what anybody's saying because when you're talking i'm thinking about the questions down here instead of yeah. just engaging in what you're saying which makes a huge difference the other day i stood up in front of the jury the other day i made an hour and a half speech the first 15 minutes of it were not great and they weren't great because i was trying to read it and i was concentrating going back to the points because there were certain points i really wanted to make and for whatever reason I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I just got into my head that I was, I was going to miss these points. I convinced myself I was going to miss them. So I'd had them all written. And after 15 minutes, just closed the laptop, just put it down and just spoke to them for the next hour and 15 minutes. Didn't miss any of the points. And it was far better and far more engaging because it was just me being myself. And, and absolutely right. So it, it, 
a lot of people can be that way. I mean, I, I, there was another chap in the same trial. He made a speech that he clearly read out. He'd obviously written it word for word, read it out word for word, and it was funny and it was well-timed, it was well-judged, and it was him because that's just how he works. There's no criticism of anyone that they work that way. It's just what works for the person. But you've got to make sure that you find out what works for you because if you're, if you're kidding yourself that something works for you that really doesn't, that's where the problem hits. What was your first high profile case? Um, first high profile case was a murder that I did uh, almost immediately after, after getting taken on. I was put into a murder in the Old Bailey. It was three and a half months. I was the youngest person in it by, I mean, I was 23. Um, it was an honor killing. It was uh, a, a Sri Lankan gang. They had allegedly killed this chap because he'd upset one of their uncles or disrespected one of their uncles. So he was corralled. You know, they, they basically corralled him to a point in an estate and not they, but someone beat him to death with uh, cricket bats and um, hockey sticks. So that, that was quite high profile at the time. It's 20 years ago. Um, it, the interesting thing about that is that's a case that actually ended up lasting 10 years because I did that trial. Um, I, I was the junior on that trial. And so in murders and bigger trials, you'll have a leading barrister and a junior barrister. And I'm not going to lie, I should not have been the junior on that barrister at that stage of my career. I, I didn't contribute anything, basically. I was there every day. I was taking a note. The poor man that was leading me, a great barrister called Michael Haynes, was effectively doing the case by himself. You, you shouldn't have a kid on a case like that. And that was the first time round. <clears throat> then we got an appeal. And it was the conviction was overturned and they were tried again. So second time round, I was led by a QC. And I won't name him uh, because he was never there. And I don't, want, I don't want to sort of name and shame. But he was never there. He was there for six days of a three-month trial. So I basically did that trial myself. And we lost again. But the difference in that time, so I think it was six years later, the difference between the, the kid who had done that at that point and then doing it again six years later, although the result was the same, was, was a, incredible. We ended up appealing it again and it was overturned again and there was an order that would be no retrial. So everyone who was convicted has been convicted twice and then had their conviction crossed cross twice in that particular trial. But it was the first big one that I did. Yeah. So even you go through a court case and you, you're up late and you're trying to get the right result, like how hard is it when you lose? Um, <clears throat> is that a personal thing or is it just work? Where you I, think I, it's I can just... take it a bit personally, I'll be honest. I, it, depends, <clears throat> it depends how much I've convinced myself we've won. By the time I make a speech, I am very convinced of my case. And it's kind of a psychological thing. I have to be very convinced of my case to make that speech because I make speeches in a very particular way. I, I don't I don't like to talk out a jury. A lot of people will talk at a jury. I, I like to talk to a jury. And a lot of eye contact, a lot of engagement, a lot of... I like to bring their attention to the defendants a lot. They should never forget that those men there, you know, their lives are in their hands, and they should not forget that. And so I do a lot of engagement with that. And, and the only way to do that is to really believe in your case. But I'm not going to lie. The moment my ass touches the seat, if I'm re then the realism does come back in, and suddenly it's like, well, that went well, but whereas other times you'll think that went really well and he should be acquitted. In those second circumstances, I can take it fairly hard. Um, I've, I've defended two people in my career that I think I know absolutely were innocent. And it doesn't mean that the others weren't, but I think I, I'm 100% sure these two men were innocent and one of them was convicted and went to prison for 18 months. I took that one particularly hard because... I genuinely believe that he hadn't done it. What happens if somebody comes in, all the evidence, your defending somebody that's blatantly guilty, but they still want to go through with it? Like, how hard is that? Like, you know they're going to get done, but some, you know a lot of ego can kick in, a lot of pride that they don't want to bow down to the system. Like, is that a difficult one as well? Do you know it's easy? It's, it's much easier. So. The pressure's off mm -hmm. because I will have told them, I will have told them categorically. The words that I basically use, it's not a, not a script, but the words that I generally use, I'll say, look, but when we're in court, it will be all guns blazing. You know, I'll be on, I'll be putting on a show. You will not think for a moment that I have a single doubt in your innocence. I said, but between these four walls, I'm also obliged to tell you the truth. And you are, you, you have no chance. You just don't have any chance of winning this, et cetera, et cetera. I've been wrong. 
I've told people that they fought it and they won. Rarely, but it has happened. But generally, you'll sit there and say, you've just got no chance in this case. The other thing that I say to them is getting you the best result doesn't always mean not guilty. Getting you the best result in some circumstances means getting you the best sentence. And the way you can guarantee your sentence is to be realistic and then see what we can do with the facts to demonstrate that you might be guilty, but you're not as guilty as they say. And therefore, your culpability is lower and so your sentence is lower. Uh, and, you know, and in a lot of cases, in, in maybe, maybe the majority of cases, that's the right approach. So you're, what do they call it, the final speech, when you do the talk? And the, the closing speech. The closing yep. speech. So see the closing speech, is that a big part of the jury making their conviction or is that they've already made a decision? Like how big is that speech? I, For me, in my cases, I think it's it's fundamental because that's how I approach a case. Everything that I do in a case, I see every single question that I ask is a brick that allows me to build a bit more of that speech. So I have a case theory in my head I work towards that case theory. Occasionally something will happen in the trial that will throw the case theory off and you have to throw those bricks away and start building again a completely different wall. But generally, everything I do is to, is, is to allow me to make the best possible speech. And I do think that what is one of the big fundamental features in cases that I do. Uh, there are others. I mean, how well your defendant does in a witness box is crucial. Whether you even put the defendant in the witness box is crucial is crucial. It used to be that the general rule was, if you don't have to, don't put them anywhere near a witness box. Because the cliche was, <laughs> your case is at its best before they go in. It never gets better after they go in. And that's still kind of true. But we, I mean, even look at what we're doing now and think about social media and think about all of the things. We tell everyone what we have for dinner now. We tell everyone the books we've read. We tell everyone, oh, I just saw this film. Here's my opinion. We're all sharing everything now. And if you're alleged to have done something serious and you don't get in and share, we now live in a society where I believe a jury look at that and think, that's a bit weird. So whereas 20 years ago, 21 years ago, you would generally not put someone in. Now I think it's sometimes a mistake to not put someone in because I think the society's changed and we're such sharers. The English and the British never used to be sharers. We used to keep stuff to ourselves. I still, I'm still inclined to keep things to myself, but, um, but most people aren't. Do you think mobile phones have made your job easier or harder with people being tracked and messages? Infinitely and harder, <clears throat> infinitely harder. More I, convictions with yeah, mobile I found, phones? Than... I, I found the whole the whole stuff about the COVID vaccine, hilarious. They're putting that in your body so they know where you are. We're all walking, with, we're all walking around with the world's best tracking device in our, in our pocket. It's absolutely absurd. You don't need an, an isotope in your blood. We've, we're all being tracked daily. You don't walk more than 30 meters without being recorded on the camera in this country. I don't think the people in this country realize quite how much compared to other countries we're tracked. It makes everywhere else, including even China, look positively liberal. You know, it's 30, 30 meters maximum if you are in any form of city or even any town, you're on a video camera. But that just doesn't matter. Your mobile phone will convict you every time. It will convict you every single time if you don't know what to do about it. And without giving a lesson on what you should do about a mobile phone, it's a killer. It's an absolute killer. And when we get round mobile phone evidence in a case, the thing with mobile phone evidence also is, is perceptions. You add that and then you add in perceptions from TV. I know CSI is not on anymore, but all those kinds of shows, uh, especially when CSI was on, we had, that was a terrible time. There was that sort of five year period where CSI was massive. And when that was going on, you had to explain to every single jury, you can't zoom in. None of those things they do really work. So stop asking. You'd have letters coming from the jury. Like, Could we zoom in on this photograph? Well, you can, but all you'll see is pixels uh, because they see it on there and obviously they'll zoom in and suddenly it'll be really clear. It's, it's not how digital photography works. But, um, but going back to the mobile phone, it's the perceptions of it as well. So a jury will think a mobile phone can tell you can zoom in. And so if, if I had my mind's over there at the moment, but if it was sitting in my pocket, they would think they could place me at this table. A mobile phone is actually much better at telling you where the, where the user of the phone, not a person, because you don't know who's using it. Uh, there's a lot of other evidence you need to bring in for that. But a mobile phone's very good at telling you where someone's not. 
But actually working out where someone is, is, is much more difficult. If you think about this circle on this table, um, what a mobile mast does, if this is the mast in the middle, you've got three sectors, they're called azimuths. You have a sector there, azimuth there, an azimuth there, and an azimuth there, almost like a CND badge. And all they can do is say, are you in that sector within five kilometers of that mast, maximum five kilometers. And that's about it. That's all they can do. Now that is actually enough if you're tracking someone, if you're following them from X to Y and they live at X and Y is where it takes place, well then that becomes evidence. But actually it's nowhere near as strong as people think it is. So mobile phones are terrible for defense of, of crimes that have actually occurred. But maybe that's the point. Maybe they should be. Maybe you know, from a point of view of society, that should be how it is. But they're not as effective as people think they are. And that's what makes them even harder, is that people think that they can show a lot more than they can. Mm -hmm. So it's they do make things harder, but actually perception of them makes it even harder mm -hmm. because they're not actually as effective as, yeah. as you think. Anthony Joshua, heavyweight champion of the world, kid from London, phenomenal career. What he's achieved is unbelievable. His fight against Klitschko, one of the best I've ever seen. That unbelievable what he's came from. He started boxing late, but we all, we all know now we get charged with yeah. weed, I think, and you represented him in that case yeah. and won him that case. That like, you saved the guy's life, and he's probably thank is thankful for it. I'd imagine. But how did that he case is. come about? <laughs> Um, because of my past in boxing, um, and my, 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 there's a solicitor that I work with all the time. Um, I refer to him as my business partner. Technically, I shouldn't refer to him that way. Um, because we, we have two separate businesses that are just fairly interlinked. Um, but he is a, he's a former boxer. He used to box in Scotland. Um, I, I used to box a lot and, you know, have a long career in boxing as well. And we were introduced about, by my, head of, by my head of chambers. He was introduced to an awful lot of barristers who claimed to have boxed. They'd all basically been to boxer size. Um, so he, he, he agreed to meet me on sufferance. We met each other. We, we knew within 30 seconds of speaking that actually we both had, and it was true in this case. So we ended up getting on very well. And over time, he started giving me a lot of work because a barrister's work comes from a solicitor. He started giving me a lot of work. I started sending a lot of my contacts to him to then come back to me. Um, because you can't go to a barrister unless you go through a solicitor. And we started working together a hell of a lot. <clears throat> we were both very well known in the boxing world, him more than me. He was very well known in the boxing world because he did an awful lot of contract work for them. Now, I don't know anything about contract work, so I would look after people when they got in trouble, either disciplinary in the sport, so doping or <clears throat> going too far in the ring, much rarer, harder to do that, uh, or getting in trouble outside. <clears throat> but um, he... He was approached about Josh. Now we, we'd never heard of him. We, we knew he'd won the ABAs at this point, and we, you know, I think we had heard the name, but we didn't know who he was. But it was in 2011. We were approached by his um, his coach at Finchley Boxing Club, and they said, "Look, we've got this kid. He's got himself in trouble. <clears throat> he could be fighting in the Olympics next year." But in order to qualify for the Olympics, he has to fight in the Europeans. And the Europeans are coming up in a few weeks. And because of the trouble, they have taken his license away. And so he can't fight in the qualifying championship until this is resolved. So we got it expedited, got it all sorted out for as quick as we possibly could. And we went to court for trial. And when we went to court for trial, oh, pardon me, when we went to court for trial, I... I couldn't win the case. We knew we couldn't actually win the case in the circumstances. So we had a very sensible conversation with the prosecutor and a sensible conversation with the judge. And the conversation we basically had was, look, yeah, we understand that he's committed the offense. We understand that it is what it is. And I don't mind saying that publicly because obviously he's been very straight about it himself. He's on record, he's in a book. Otherwise I'd have to be much more circumspect. But the reality is he'd done what he'd done. But the punishment was going to was going to end his career. The punishment would have ended his career. The punishment would have he would never have fought in the Europeans. Without fighting in the Europeans, he couldn't have fought in the Olympics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, on the back of all of that, um, I, I just fronted that up to the judge and said, "You know, the reality is, we'll have to fight this case, and then we'll lose this case. But if he was to plead guilty to possession, 
which obviously he's guilty of as well. If he's particularly guilty of possession, you could give him the harshest possible period of unpaid work. <clears throat> That would allow him to get his license back. It would allow him to fight in the Europeans. It would allow him to fight in the Olympics. It would allow him in his future to fight in America, which he could never have done if he'd had a, a supply on his record. It allows him to have his life. It also allows him to spend 300 hours in boxing clubs in a few months time once he's famous, helping kids who might otherwise be on the streets. So it allows it to be paid forward. And as an outcome for a case like this, for a kilo of cannabis, as an outcome for a case like this, surely that's a far more positive outcome to society than sending him into a prison for a short amount of time, ruining his future, no career left. Surely that's better. The judge agreed. Prosecutor ultimately agreed with some encouragement from the judge. And that's the route we went down. And as you say, that the next day, Scott, the, got the solicitor jumped on the train up to Cardiff, got before the ABAs, basically made the same submission, say, look, it's, he's not guilty of supply. He's just guilty of possession. You can give him his license back. They did that. He went to the Europeans. He came second, but second was good enough to qualify for the Olympics and the rest is history. And you mentioned the Klitschko fight. He gave me ringside seats to that and I couldn't go because of a bloody family wedding. <laughs> No, nah. and I sat at the I sat at the van, and it wasn't even my family; it was my wife's family. I sat at the wedding, watching the fights with my wife kicking me under the table. I was like, "Look, I didn't go to the fight. I'm at least watching the fight." <laughs> because they didn't start boxing <clears throat> till late. Now that's why I've got to give him so much credit for everything mm. he's achieved. He's just a kid from London. Yeah, they try to that survival mode, and you know yourself in these streets, it's drink, drugs, violence. Yep. Like that was the norm like, and especially him, where he's from he's from Watford which yeah, is yeah and to come through that and to then be champion of the world like yes he's had a blip the last yeah. year or so but that's that's boxing for you especially the calibre of boxers yeah. now and it's unbelievable what he's achieved and how much that case there is outpathed as whole life man but well, it's, it's, it's what they call a hinge of battle moment I mean well, they go back to a saying about what ifs and it's a what if or it's a hinge of battle there's a moment you can pick it's very rare you can do it but you can see in his life you can pick that one moment that changed everything uh, and, and it is it's that moment mm -hmm. how was it seeing him winning the belts that um did you, it, did you feel anything for that or was it just another case no i did feel some i i felt i actually did feel big um well about that more so than any other cases uh simply because i got to boast about it a little bit <laughs> but i'm not gonna lie but mainly because we played our part in that you know, we actually genuinely played our part in that and what what he was doing was exactly what i told the judge he would do so it's kind of vindication validation for what i'd said because it was right you know, often people think we just stand up and say whatever's going to work and of course we try what we try everything we can within reason for our clients uh, but sometimes you are telling the truth entirely so i mean some, there's exaggeration and there's elaboration and there's all the different things we never lie um you can't lie we absolutely I and mean, people may, may not believe that but we don't if a client tells us they're guilty we can't represent them uh, you know, it's, it's the rules are simple and we wouldn't take the risk of doing that for someone we don't know say well yeah you've told me that but just don't tell anyone you told me that because the chances are they will one day tell someone they told you that so you don't take those risks um but quite often you will put across the best case scenario and to see the best case scenario especially when it is very much the best best case scenario you've ever given because it's not every day i get to stand up and say but this man could be the heavyweight champion of the world i got to say that one day and then he became that yeah because it just shows we're giving people a chance what can be done listen a lot of people get chances and let's be honest they fuck yeah. it up they don't why was it's so much on him that he would become heavyweight champion. Why was there so much belief to go and try and get the right result for him to then give him the chance that why Anthony Josh when it ended up working out amazingly, but why him? Was it a, a feeling? Was it was a an it, energy connection. Like what was it? It was almost all wrapped up in London 2012. Olympics. And, and the, the Olympics and the belief. And, and I'll be honest, I, I spoke about a world heavyweight championship during, during my time in the court, but my focus really was on the Olympics. My focus really was was on you know, this is this is next year, this is in London. I knew very well from every previous Olympics I've ever seen that he was going to get the hometown advantage. And no offence to Josh, he needed the hometown advantage in that first fight. People often talk about the second, the, the final, and they say, "Oh well, did he win that?" 
yeah. But the final could have gone either way. It was subjective. It was whatever. And, and I felt he won. The first fight he had against a Cuban, I think he very much got a hometown decision on that. And there was an expectation that that would happen if he needed one. You know, and, and it was an expectation that this is almost someone who's fated to do something. And and it very much and he was also a really nice guy when I met him, I'll be honest. Um, I really liked him. We sat in Wood Green Crown Court talking boxing for hours while we were waiting for a decision to be made. Because I made these representations early in the morning. And a barrister who's prosecuting can't just make a decision. They have to go back to the CPS and the CPS have to un underwrite it and confirm it and and it all takes time. So he and I, after we'd done our bit, he and I spent hours chatting i mean just chatting away and talking boxing and i mean at one point <laughs> at one point embarrassingly now i look back on it he was telling me i mean at this point at this time in our in his career i'd had more boxing matches than him i'd fought more rounds than he had but i was still you know i was still 30 31 and not not in the shape i'd had been at 21 and um and we were talking boxing and he was saying well i have trouble I, i've had a bit of trouble with this particular style of boxing which was basically my style of boxing and at one point i even volunteered i'll come down and spa with you Thank God that never happened. <laughs> it just didn't even, it's, uh -huh. you're talking to someone, it doesn't even really, that, because you're talking about something you love, you get carried away. I was like, that's exactly what you do. That's exactly my style. Come down, we'll spar with you. We'll, we'll sort that out, Josh. Don't worry. Thank God that never happened. Because you're right. going to kill me. <laughs> so you get charged with possession. What happens if you get charged with supplying? But what? he was charged with supplying. But that, that's what we got him off. That, yeah. That's what we, we got him to drop. Yeah, but what if he got charged with it? What if he got if he'd been convicted, convicted of it? If he'd been convicted of it, then there would have been no career. Um, he only got his license back because that was because that was gone. Possession's one thing. Supply is I mean, they're both crimes, but one's an overt criminal enterprise. The other one is I'm doing something I'm not supposed to do. And so in terms of the if it had been supply, he would never have been able to fight in America. Now that would have made him unattractive at that time, although he's only fought there once. At that time, America was the place for heavyweight boxing. It was changing. You know, it had still been very much Klitschko's in Germany, but it was still kind of where you had your heavyweight boxing. Um, that's changed very much since then. And But no one knew that change was coming. No one knew that, that, would, that, that the Klitschko's thing would be the beginning of the status quo. So he would have been very unattractive to any promoter. Um, he, and he wouldn't have obviously been coming in with a gold medal from the Olympics, which was why he was so attractive. So he wouldn't have had his gold medal. He wouldn't have had his European silver. Um, he wouldn't have been able to fight in America. He would have found a promoter, but it, who knows what he would have achieved. Um, it would have been, what I can say is it would have been an enormously more difficult, massive, massive, massively harder. Also, what we can't ever know is how many kids were helped by training with him. Those 300 hours of unpaid work that he did in boxing clubs, you know, giving on, giving back to kids, paying it back, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows how many children might have gone one way but didn't? How many children were, oh, I want to do this now? You know, how many people learned from the example? We don't know. It might be none. It could be 100, but you just don't know. Yeah, it's mad to think that how somebody, how one can decision can, can change your life. Let's tell you, can that a split second can change your life and good on them for kicking on and actually staying on the path because yep. there's been a lot of doubters thinking they'll just go back or he'll not go as far as he did but like you say he was the king of the world yep. and um, it's fair play to yourself as well that is he thankful for that he gave us a lot of free tickets for a very long time <laughs> so, mm. so yeah, yeah. Good we, on we, him, we've not been in touch with him for a while now uh, he's, I think he's still in touch with Scott occasionally um, uh, but the difference in a barrister and a solicitor is a barrister is normally you know, the air on the day you you do your part of the thing, but the relationship is normally built with the solicitor. Yeah. So, so he's, he's much longer term relationship was with Scott, but yeah, we'd always get the tickets coming through. And as I say, we had the tickets to the Klitschko fight that I couldn't go to. Uh, I will always resent that <laughs> always. <laughs> and, um, we went to watch him fight Uzek actually, but we paid for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But fair play to him for providing tickets. Like you see, you can't yeah. just keep giving for years and years. But yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. People yeah. fall out of touch, but a great story. What about the gold bullion one I read? Like, what was that court case? Ah, uh, the gold bullion one was Did somebody um, get tasered or something twenty four <laughs> times or fourteen times. <laughs> that was that, that was the one time that I've ever been intimidated by a by a defendant. Um, I was twenty two, twenty three, and this guy was former French Foreign Legion uh, English bloke. I mean, he's massive. He was just massive, about my height. Two of me across. I mean, arms like they just just massive. 
And when I went into the room, he's sitting there with his arm wrapped up in his sling. And even down to the way they'd wrapped the arm up, it just showed how massive his arm was. And, and what I had to tell him effectively was, you've got no defense. You were found driving. The they'd robbed a load of gold bullion. And they and they'd brought, they just didn't anticipate how how heavy it was. And so they're driving off in a van. They had no way of getting away. The van just couldn't hit, it couldn't hit any kind of speed. So ultimately they get stopped. The police, you know, jackknifed them. They get stopped. He jumps out. And I imagine the police have done his, have had exactly the same reaction that I had walking into the cell. I think they've looked at him and thought, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> we got, how are we taking this guy down? And it took them something like 17 different uh, hits with the taser to finally keep him down. And, uh, and, and I had to go and say to him, you've got no defense. You're looking at about 17 years. And I was thinking, how's he going to react to that? I mean, what, what, how's he going to react to that news? And his reaction was, he looked at me, he smiled. He said, well, you win some, you lose some. And I just thought, thank God for that. <laughs> I just, thank God that was the reaction because I did not want him kicking off. Obviously, you've done a bit of boxing. You can handle yourself. What are you about six four, six five? Uh, six, six two. Six two. Yeah. So you're obviously a unit yourself. Like, did anyone ever try and put it on you though? <laughs> several times. Yeah, several times. Weirdly enough, there's something strange about what I wear in court. Obviously, it's something very strange. It's six, this 18th century fancy dress, but <clears throat> it stops people remembering you're a bloke. It stops people remembering that you are bigger than them. And it stops them thinking that maybe when you take that stuff up, you might go to a gym and hit a bag or you might have some experience of life outside of that courtroom because <clears throat> they get very aggressive from what they've seen and they wait for you occasionally. It's happened to me a few times. <clears throat> the most recent time it happened, someone was saying, no, no, wait in here because he's outside. I said, are you serious? Did you see this fella? This is a man I made cry in a witness box and I'm going to worry about going outside. So it's happened, I think, three times. If I'm thinking, is it three times? Or I miss, certainly twice. I think it's three times. And every time it's had the same react, had the same effect. So I walk out. I don't, I won't have my jacket on because you can see someone's size much better just in a shirt. I won't have my jacket on. I walk out and as I get the closer and closer you get to them, you see the, 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 the look in the eye suddenly changes and, and nothing happens. What you generally find is proper villains or proper, proper people involved in professional crime. Don't mess about with lawyers. There's no interest in messing about with lawyers. You're kind of either prosecutors or I've, I've, there's one particular prosecutor I know and I, I'd heard someone speaking about him and I thought, I need to put this to bed because the guy talking about him was, was a dangerous guy. And so I interceded and said, you're wrong. I said, yeah, you're actually talking. They thought he'd, he'd done something dishonest with the police to, to get the conviction. And I said, look, I've got, to, I've got to tell you for what it's worth. I've known the man 20 years. He's the most honest person I know. You're just wrong. He hasn't done that. And they disagreed with me. They said, well, we think he has. And as simple as that, we're not going to, we're not going to listen. And I said, well, I, I need to persuade you because I think it, and they said, no, 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 nothing can happen. Nothing will happen to him. And at that point, I realized that even the prosecutors are kind of, it's just, it, it's hands off. It's almost like a sacrosanct. You don't touch the lawyers, even if you think they fitted you up. This guy that I'm talking about certainly hasn't. There's no way he had. Um, but they didn't believe me. And yet still, like, no, nothing will happen to him. Don't worry. But that's just our opinion. And so it's very rare that there's any kind of confrontation because of that. So the confrontation will normally come from people who aren't actually probably warrant being worried about right. <clears throat> hence whenever i've walked out they've thought twice once you get outside and yeah what is it with the attire <clears throat> or the, the cape and the wig why is that still here in this day? <clears throat> i don't know <laughs> I, I i don't know and yet i'd hate to see it go mm -hmm. um i don't i do think it, it creates a difference in court it creates a different level in court between the barrister and the and the witness and i think that distinction is important I do think it, it, it formalizes the occasion. It's, it makes everything, it makes everything more authoritative and it just, it just, to me, it works, but maybe that's because I'm just used to it. But to me, it works. Yeah, see, when back in the day when I was at courts and shit, man, it, it's kind of spooky. It kind of yeah. gives you a fright. You think, fuck, it's got a weird fucking mm. airy vibe, man. Yeah. As soon as you see that cape and you're thinking, fuck, I think that's, and I think that's what's, it's, it's, I wouldn't say scary, but it's, mm. It's creepy. It's like just that presence where you think, fuck. And you, when, they, when they talk, you listen, they've got a folder under yeah. the arm with your paperwork and you're thinking. And, I think, and that's what I mean about the formality and the status. Yeah. I think it affords you a status. It's a status that, that, that 
plenty of barristers don't deserve, but it still gives that status. And if you go to a, 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 um, a magistrate's court and you're a barrister in a magistrate's court, you've, you notice that you're not treated the same. You're not treated quite the same, even by the defendants, because you're just in a suit. Whereas when you've got that stuff on, it, it just creates that aura of something. It also creates some anonymity. So, you know, the likes of me, I can walk out and not worry about someone recognizing me and wanting to do something. But some, some people can't. Some people would be more worried if they were instantly recognizable. And so it does give the protection of anonymity as well. So seeing you put that on, is, it, is, is that a switch, game time? Yeah. What, can you... When you take everything off, do you leave your work at home though? Or do you leave your work there and you go home a different character or are you constantly thinking about cases? I, I, I definitely go home a different character because I'm sure I play a character in court. Whether I realise I'm doing it or not, I'm definitely doing that. I'm playing a character when I go into court. I'm playing the barrister. Um, I don't need to be that barrister to think about the cases. So that character is put to the side. Once I go, once I go home, when I'm back to being myself entirely, I will still be thinking about the cases because you have to. I mean, we're now instantly available, aren't we, all around the clock? You know, I've got people phoning me up at nine, nine at night, half nine at night from prison cells. Um, one of the reasons, <laughs> one, one, one of the biggest complaints um, about law firms is, is, oh, we can never get the lawyers. And so I decided a few years ago we would make ourselves available much more readily. And my God, people have jumped on that. Um, it's very good in terms of the work that comes in, keeps the work coming in, means we're on top of the cases. It means that they are, um, <clears throat> it means that they are also up to date in a way that others aren't. But the problem is, as with everything, people become complacent. And now, if they can't get me at nine o'clock on a Friday night, they moan about that. Well, yeah, I couldn't get you the other day. So when did you last speak to a barrister on the phone? Other than me. When? Never. So the fact you can get me sometimes should be good enough for you. And I also also explain to them, you're in a cell and you've got nothing else to think of. So when you phone me three times in a day and you don't get me three times, you think I'm ignoring you. You haven't taken into account that all of your phone calls have come while I'm on my feet in court and of course can't answer the phone. Uh, or if, if a, even if they're not at that time, that's 30 seconds per call of my day that I just happen to have missed. That doesn't mean I'm ignoring you. It means I haven't been able to answer the call and I can't phone you back because you're in a prison. And so that's the, it, it's, it's kind of, no matter, it, you're kind of damned if you do or damned if you don't, but you're much more damned if you don't. So, mm. so it's. See, when you're doing the cases and that and you get to see images of people <clears> being shot, killed, all that stuff, like, how damaged is, is that upstairs? This is why I like these podcasts so much because I, Police officers, <clears throat> a lot of people can be anti authority, but people need to understand what these people actually go through on a yep. daily basis. Like the shit that they see, like the kids and all that madness. Far like, worse than what we yeah. see. They see far worse and than us. People need to understand to pick that job, man. You've kind of, it's the shit that they go through. I know there's a lot of people turn to drink drugs with being in the police force. I've interviewed enough people now, but it's it's mad to think people don't see what they actually have to go through. It's not just a case of trying to catch criminals or put your uncle or your dad in jail. The shit that they yep. need to see daily. Like, did you do you have to go through that also with images? I, the worst thing I ever saw wasn't a dead thing. The worst thing, and I, I'm not going to give you details of this because it will haunt you, because it still haunts me. I I've only ever been involved in one child sex case in my career. I always said I wouldn't do it. Always said categorically I will not get involved in a case like that. There is a thing called the cab rank rule, which means you have to accept the cases you're given. But I said to my clerks, look, I don't want to accept those cases, so don't give me them. So I, I'm not allowed to refuse them. Please don't give me them. One time I was asked to go to South End, and they said, it's a sentence in South End. What's it for? I uh, don't worry, their papers will be at court. So they'd obviously not been able to find anyone else to do it. They put it on me to go and do it, but hadn't told me what it was. <clears throat> I would have gone anyway, because it's my job. But they dishonestly didn't tell me what it was. I got to South End. I opened the pay, opened the case, and what I saw was it was a man. He was charged with a sexual assault of a child, um, and also possession of photos. Now, when you have these photos, you have to go in with the judge and the prosecutor, and you have to grade them. There's level one to level four, if I remember right. It might be five. Um, it's a long time ago now since I did it. <clears throat> it's level one to four or five, five, four or five being the worst, and. <clears throat> many of these photographs in this case were, were were the minor ones, but I think there were six or seven of the top ones. And 
without telling you anything about them, I would say this. Not only do you look at it and, and think, how can you be turned on by this? You actually look at it and think, how the fuck did you even conceive this? How did this even occur to you as something to do? That's how bad it is. I came out um, and the, at the time, we used to have solicitors come with us to court. We don't anymore, but there'd always be a solicitor to support you back in the day. And I came out and the solicitor who knew me well said, Jesus, you've gone white. And I had gone completely white. <clears throat> and I just drained from what I had to see. I then stood up and did my job. And one of the worst aspects of the whole thing is I did my job well. I, <clears throat> I, I, I did a good job for the man um, because that's what I do. And then I sat down and you were asking earlier about playing a character and all that sort of thing. And that's kind of what I was doing. And when I sat down and my backside touched the seat, the second I was sitting down, I was just, just lost everything. It was just disgust in myself. And the one thing I could think, I think I was 25 or 26. The one thing I was thinking was me at 21 would have beaten the shit out of me at 25 for saying half of the things that I just said. So <clears throat> I went to, had to go and see him in the cell because you have to. He tried to shake my hand. That didn't happen. Um, some words were exchanged that I won't repeat because I'll get in trouble. Um, I, could, I could be suspended for saying what was said, uh, but you can imagine. Um, I then went up and I phoned my mum. I went upstairs into the car, phoned my mum and just broke down crying. And then um, went and got drunk for two days. And she ended up getting my pupil master, who was the guy I mentioned earlier, who was my best mate, he was my best man. I was his best man, etc. She ended up after two days phoning him saying, I can't have not heard from him, can you go and make sure he's all right? And he came and found me where I was just basically just, I, I couldn't deal with it, couldn't deal with it at all. So that's the only thing that I've never been able to deal with. And I, I mean, when I tell this story, I get a bit upset because I can remember the pictures. And it's just horrible, absolutely yeah, yeah. horrible. Yeah, and and so I look at police officers and I think, you've got to do that every day. How do they do it? You'll find, weirdly, that defence barristers have a lot of respect for police officers. The ones that are wrong are absolutely reprehensible. The ones that are corrupt are absolutely reprehensible. The ones that are lazy and aren't very good at their job, well, they're pretty bad as well, because you should be, if you, there's a great responsibility in that job. You should be good at your job if that's your job. There's no excuse for being lazy. There's no excuse for being competent. The ones who are criminal, the ones who are corrupt, should be put in prison for a very long time, in open prison with the people they fitted up. But having said all of that, you know, at the moment, there's a very big anti-police sentiment going on. I'm afraid 95% of them are excellent. That might be, 95% of them are good. Of that 95%, I'd say 80% of them are excellent. They're, it's, it's a really hard job. And I have the utmost respect for almost all of them, yeah. despite the fact that we are, are you know, we're, we're on opposing sides. So even you've got the villains and stuff, I think is, what it say sexy, but we've all watched crime films. It's kind of, yeah. we, we're getting kind of sucked into all the, the bad images and yeah. the, the bad boys and the crime and the gangsters. Let's see when you've got a big high profile case, does it, do you get excited that you're, you're working in something or is it just a case another day at the office? No, I'm not going to lie. If, you, if you're in a big high pro profile case, you enjoy it. A lot of people would tell you not, but I don't think they're telling the truth. We didn't go into this case to defend um, shoplifters, this job, sorry, to defend shoplifters. I didn't go in this job to argue about double yellow lines or the calibration of the Gatso speed camera. You know, I went into this job to do proper, as you said, sexy crime. There is an element of that. I'm probably not supposed to, to admit it, but of course there is. If you're seeing something on the front page of the news, you want to be in that. You want to be in that case. There are limits on that. I don't want to represent Wayne Cousins, but I do want to represent Brinks Matt, and I do want to represent the Securical robbery. Yeah, they're the interesting cases. They're the sexy cases, and of course you want to be in them. Is there any case you would have loved to have been on? I think I just, meant, I think I just mentioned them. <laughs> <laughs> they're the two that I look at. I think I don't, um, obviously, Brinks Matt's a long time before my time, and I wasn't senior enough mm -hmm. to be considered for the Secure Corps, but Craig, my pupil master, was in Secure Corps. He was led by David Cameron's brother, Alex, in that case. I mean, that was some case that would have been yeah. very interesting to do. I've watched, I'm watching this stuff on Netflix now, because I'm trying to get Kane and Oyo on. Um, right. I've got a few contacts that know him, but he doesn't, he's old school. You don't yeah. really, whether you ever see him in front of a camera, I just don't know. A lot of people have surprised a lot of people with some guests I've yeah. had on. Um, but that story is mad with the golden. The thing, you're going to get him. I think you, you're more likely to get him now than any other time. Because yeah. I've, I've heard 
via various um, various contacts that might 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 or might not know him that he's quite happy with his portrayal in gold. Um, he's portrayed by the chap, the Scottish chap, isn't he? Who um, who plays the lead in um, in that that fantastic slow horses. Um, but yeah, I think Kenny Noyes at the moment is probably the best time to get him, isn't it? Probably the most likely time to get him. This is where because his, na his, na his name's out there and, yeah. and uh, in a way that for once he quite likes. Yeah, because <laughs> the papers have portrayed them as this and that over the years, and you're going to get that in that involvement. Charlie Bronson's up for parole. Yeah. When you're looking at that and seeing the things that he's doing, and everybody loves Charlie. Like he's done 50 years in prison, he's never killed mm. anybody. Listen, he's a mad bastard. You've got yeah. to be honest. Like he's took people hostages, yeah. and he has a screw loose. If you're yeah. uh, truly honest, but when you look at that, do you think he will <clears> ever get out? I don't think he's going to get out this time. I think um, from what I've seen, they keep saying they keep saying he couldn't handle the outside. I don't believe that's an assessment you can carry out if you're not outside. So I think they at least need to move into an open prison and give him some conditions and give him some opportunity. Because, I mean, they've taken that man's entire life. That man's whole life has been gone because he doesn't react well, pardon me, to custody. Clearly, he doesn't react well to custody. So to suggest, well, he, can't be, he wouldn't be able to handle being outside. He can't handle being inside. That's why he's been in there so long, because he's not reacted well to it. And he's, of course, he's done the ridiculous things he's done. But it's been... A, he needs a chance, doesn't he? I think he absolutely, absolutely needs a chance. He's an old man. He's got a lot of money from his art. I mean, he's a multimillionaire. Let him come out and enjoy his life. And all right, he's, put him on his life license. He's straight back in if he needs to be straight back in. But I think, you know, give him a chance. Without trying to be too controversial about it, how many pedophiles do we let out? And, and, and they're, they're released and then they're back in. Look at Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter last night is back in for trying to access the dark web. Um, the difference between a paedophile and Charles Bronson is paedophilia is a sexuality. Paedophilia, that can't be cured. They don't try and cure, you know, they're not saying there's a cure for gayness, but you don't cure gayness, you don't cure straightness, you don't cure sexualities. Paedophilia is a sexuality, it can't be cured. So by its very definition, they are always a danger. Always, that's never changing. And yet we let them out. And we let them out to, in many cases, offend again. In many cases, not. So why are we not allowing the same, the, the, giving the same leeway to someone like Charles Bronson? A man who, all right, he might come out and there might be some danger to what he does once he comes out. But he is in his 70s. It's quite unlikely that he's going to be bashing too many people up. And again, they can pull him back in. I just believe the man needs a chance. I think he really does need a chance. Yeah, that's all you can do. Let's go for my chance. If mm. he fucks up, then he's in for the rest of his life. It's Absolutely. That's down to him. He's old enough. And he knows that. Yeah, I think, and like I say, I don't think it's as daft as people think. Like, you don't <laughs> become a multi time all and make money. Exactly. He's in media every other week. Like, he plays the game well. But yeah. It's just give him a chance, like you say. What's the most high profile case you've worked on that you can talk about in crime or kind of villains? Um... I can't really. This is the problem. Not? I can't yeah. really. I can. The only I talk about Anthony Joshua a lot because he wrote a book about it. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, speak and, about yeah, stuff that's out there. I can speak about stuff that's out there. I can't really speak about stuff that's not. Yeah. Which I can speak. As I say, it's easy to say about the ones I'd like to be in. It's harder to talk about the ones I have been in. Yeah, so <laughs> you've got to protect your people as well. Mm. That your books. That how did you? How did you become an author? Like, how was that? Do you find these an escape with everything? Completely. You to do every day. They're a complete escape. And that's why I don't write realistic crime. I write heightened thrillers. My books are written so it's like you're watching an action film mm -hmm. or a conspiracy action film. So, I mean, the best, I'm thinking of the best, of the best description of a film that would be like them, but they're kind of like James Bond for the 21st century. There's two main characters. One's a barrister who gets up to a load of shit that a barrister will never get up to. Uh, and the other one is, is kind of my James Bond character. He's an international um, intelligence agent. And so it's all political. The first one's all about the someone trying to bring down the British government. This one's about a corrupt um, pr president in the White House. Mm -hmm. No idea where that idea came from. This one <laughs> is um, this one's about uh, a, again set in America. It's um, it's like a, a national. Well, it's kind mm -hmm. of like the guys who invaded Capitol mm -hmm. Hill. But I just I, I watched what happened with Trump uh, when they tried to take America during during the um, the transfer of power, and I thought at the time. What if it wasn't Donald Trump leading these idiots? What if actually they're being led by you know, Tony Stark from, you know, or, or, or you know, a famous, famous 
at the time, I'll be honest, I thought Elon Musk, but he's since proved himself to be a bit of an idiot. Um, but <laughs> it was Elon Musk at the time that was in my head. I thought, well, if it was Elon Musk that was doing this and not, and not Donald Trump, it would be so much more efficient, so much more dangerous. And so that's where that book came from. Uh, so the only one that's actually realistically kind of like the way the world really works is is marked for death because that's much more about a, tr it's about a trial in the old Bailey, about a murder trial and about a serial killer. So how can people get in these books? Uh, everywhere. I mean, th this one was, the first one was Zoe Ball Book Club, which uh, the second one was the uh, Richard and Judy Book Club, WH Smith, Sainsbury's, Waterstones, Amazon. Um, they're, 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 they've done very well. They've done very well. They've done a lot better than I expected them to. I mean, with the exception of Power Play, they've all been bestsellers. Mm -hmm. Power Play wasn't a bestseller because her Power Play came out in the second week of the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. So because we sell all our books, we sell in WH Smith, railway stations, airports, supermarkets. That's our big sales. Um, all the supermarkets sent all their books back because they needed shelving for tins and for toilet rock. All the railway stations were closed. All of the airports were closed. So my run of bestsellers went the one, two, four, and that was sent back. And it's very annoying because I think it's my best book. <laughs> Could you not get it back out once? We have re-released it with a new yeah. cover. Basically, if, if one of them hits massive at some point, mm -hmm. then people will rediscover it. Yeah. Uh, it's just the way that, it's the, the way the book world works. Mm -hmm. It's mad like, to be barrister and then an author. Like, you must have so much content then if you're in the environment you're in, yeah. ideas, visions to then write books. Does it make it easier with the job that you're in? It makes it harder. Uh, and the so? reason make, I mean, you just asked me a question that I couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. you just, and I said, I just can't tell you that. I, I can talk about what I'd want to be in. I can talk cases wise. It's the same with that. The people I represent all know that I'm an author. They all get a kick out of it. They all read the books. If they were to read those books and see something in there that reminded them of, of something they were involved in, the, the impact that would have on my career is enormous. Because suddenly, whether or not it touched upon something it shouldn't touch on or not, they would be worried that they can't tell me things. Mm -hmm. And if they're then worried about things that they can and can't say, the relationship dies. So... I often ref I often relate this to the myth of Tantalus, uh, which is the guy in Greek mythology who um, he, they stood him in a pool of water up to here with fruit just up there, and every time he reached for it, the fruit would move away. Every time he went down, the, get, the, the water would go down. It's where the word tantalizing comes from. And I often refer to it as that. It's like the myth of Tantalus. I'm surrounded by all this fantastic stuff, and I can't use any of it. And it's and so it's really frustrating. I have to, so if I come up for an idea for a book, I then have to run through that idea to make sure I'm not stealing anything. My current idea for a book is well, that I'm literally about to start writing. My sixth book is going to be in two eras. It'll be my. It'll be the closest thing to Mark for Death. It will be about again a serial killer and trial. And the idea of it is that I'm going to have my my main character is going to be defending someone in 2000 and then defending him again in 2023. And it's based both for murder. So the first time round, he's very, very young. Like Michael was very young and he's, um, <clears throat> and he's living the life basically that I lived when I was in my twenties. I'd, I'd love people to know what the bar was like when I was in my twenties. It was horribly politically incorrect. It was so much fun. And I want people to know that because it's not anymore. It's not the same. Yeah, you know, the world has moved on a lot and we're not allowed to say or do a lot of the things we did. So I'm going to have half the book that and then half the book now. But with the two murder trials, I've got to rack my brain when I'm writing them to make sure I'm not stealing from trials that I've done. So it actually is the opposite. I mean, I've got all the inspiration in the world and I can't use any of it. <laughs> could you ever do an uh, autobiography? I, um, I think I could You've got enough at the end of my yeah, career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of my career. Henry Milner did that. Um, Henry... See? Henry Milner, oh, you need to speak to Henry Milner. You'll love Henry Milner. Yeah. Henry Milner is, um, is he was the preeminent criminal solicitor for London from through the late 70s through to the 90s. Uh, he's still around, he still does a bit, um, but he's writing books now and write, he's written his memoir. He, you've been watching Gold, haven't you? Yeah. You know the Chinese solicitor that mm -hmm. keeps turning up? That's Henry. He was not Chinese. He, he's a Jewish fellow from Hatton Garden. Um, for some reason, they're doing their normal um, diversity casting, even though it's set in the in the eighties. Uh, it's like the, 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 one of the head coppers is that lady. She didn't exist. There was no there was no women on that. But you can't do that anymore, can you? For some reason. Um, so Henry anyway. Henry represented Kenny Noy. Um, Henry represented um, the other chap. Oh, what's it? John Palmer. Um, he's, he's represented everyone. 
and he wrote a, he wrote a, mem a memoir I think about two years ago, which which I don't know how well it did because I'm not sure how well it was publicised, but that's a memoir to read from a lawyer. Yeah, that's proper old school, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Because you know what, what were you involved with the Bitcoin, and you ended up working with El Chapo's lawyer. Yeah, we did. Um, we were involved. I've got to be very circumspect about this. What can I say? <laughs> I'll, I'll say as much. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm editing myself as I'm speaking. Um, there was an allegation that this group were. I mean, they weren't British, but they're in Britain. There's an allegation that this group were involved in money laundering on the dark web, and the money laundering they would do that they were allegedly doing was very much through Bitcoin, and the FBI. And the, and the NCA and everybody basically went through the doors. Um, there's a couple of them arrested over in America. The couple of them arrested here. We dealt with them here. We had to get them a lawyer in America. So we got them El Chapo's lawyer. Um, the difference between what he charged them and what we charged them was just enough. We just looked at the difference and just thought, well, we're doing all the work. <laughs> this is just, this is, this isn't fair. This is, but it's just the culture. They just charge so much more out there. That's why Americans are so rich. But, um, we were, it was, it was over lockdown, actually, and we were doing an awful lot of back and forth um, trying to negotiate a route out of, of this that didn't involve charges and didn't involve this, that, or the other. And what became very apparent while we were doing it, it was really interesting. We, we were successful. There was no charges in the end. Um, hence, I have to be so incredibly circumspect about it. But what was really interesting was how little anyone knew about what was really going on. See, I was assumed that they've, they've got to have their great people and their great people are going to know this. Going back to gold, in fact, you, the program you've been watching, Gold, it's, it was like them. You know, when they're when they in that show, they're trying to work out how, how, how would you launder this? How would you monetize this gold? And they're all completely blank until they talk to the guy from the Customs and Excise and he works it out. It's kind of like that. But they had no man from the Customs and Excise. They were all completely oblivious to how this works and what we found was as, as, as these meetings were going on and there were I mean, hours after hours after hours gradually these guys were explaining to them it's like no 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 it's not how it works it's not it by by about the eighth meeting we were actually having lectures it was lectures on how the dark web works so a, a, i think a big part of the lack of the charge was they'd been given a free education you know it's like Oh, that's how that works. Obviously, any anything that might have been going on ended um, because you, know, you can't just not get charged and then carry on doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, and I always, I, I can't help but notice the correlation between that ending and Bitcoin going down. Now, it may be nothing. It may be completely, it may, it may be not connected at all, but it's bloody convenient in terms of yeah. timing. So that's all ended. Suddenly, Bitcoin's not worth very much. And uh, I often wonder whether there's a connection in that way. See, when you've got, because you get celebrity lawyers, like you look at the big American cases, OJ Simpsons yep. and the people who's worked in that, same as England and Scotland, like we've got Donald Finlay, he seems to have been yep. all the big cases back then. But see, when you're like a celebrity kind of lawyer, does that help with your job or does it make it harder? Like big cases are on TV and people know who you are. Um, does there more pressure come on top? I don't think there's any extra pressure to it. I've got to be honest. I don't think there's extra pressure because we would never go out there and uh, and talk bollocks about what we can achieve. There's this Asian fella at the moment doing the rounds on YouTube, and he's laughable. Uh, he's, and he's talking about, oh, 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 we'll do this and we'll do that, and we've got this person off, we've got that person off. He's saying lots of things you shouldn't say. I've got no idea why he's not been sanctioned for this already. I'm not entirely sure he's actually a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but he's giving it all this crap are they instructed me and i did this and i did that uh, even even the captions on his videos are wrong he's talking about something he's like, oh, no, and we got him out not a free man so no, no, surely you're saying he is i a actually man. think i know I yeah. think he's actually messaged me yeah. on instagram so can you do that as a, a barrister or a not lawyer? as a barrister as a barrister absolutely not what's the oh, difference um solicitors are, have have a bit more freedom um mm -hmm. Most of the rules that cover solicitors firms are much stricter than they are for barristers. But in terms of publicity, um, we, I do probably about, I probably do more than almost anyone. And, and I probably hit the limit. And, uh, and, and I do most of mine for my books. But, you know, people are interested in what I do in the day. So the book publicity turns into bar publicity. Um, I also do a lot of TV shows. I do get a lot of stuff on Netflix, like um, <clears throat> Meet, Marry, Murder and My Love and My Killer and stuff like that, where I talk about cases. They're not my cases. I'm given a 
uh, information about them. I answer questions about them and, and that's where that I'm allowed to talk about them because I didn't do them. If I did them, I wouldn't be able to. But um, so I do, I do an awful lot of that. But yeah, the, the, this guy is, um, the, yeah, going, going back to that, this guy makes these ridiculous, I mean, he's basically saying, he's actually what he says, his catchphrase, for every offence, there is a defence. He spells both words wrong. I mean, it's just, it spells both words wrong. You just look at me, how you, but so I'm not sure how he's getting away with it. I'm assuming he's not really a lawyer. <laughs> he, maybe he is, but he's just, it's laughable. And that kind of a celebrity lawyer, I think is the kind of person that's going to get themselves in trouble because he's making promises he can't deliver. What we say to people effectively is, we're going to do a good job for you. We'll do a very good job we'll be, and we'll always be honest with you and we will get you the best result we can in the circumstances. And as I said to you at the outset, the best result isn't always not guilty. And you've got to be honest about that. You know, at the very outset of a case, if you know that the best result you're going to get is a good sentence, yeah. you need to tell them because the earlier they, they, the earlier they act on that, the better the sentence will be. You know, in Glasgow's Q season, that, but you know who's top boy? It's their presence. You don't need to be doing videos. But we live in this age. Yeah. People be going through universities now mm. to do law, and they'll be making TikToks, they'll be yeah. making Instagram videos yeah. because they think that's just the way of the world. Yeah. Like, I think it was both Trammy in Glasgow. You just knew the name. He yeah. worked in all the big cases, had a presence. When he fucking spoke, people listened. Yeah. Like, that's what you want. If like, Hopefully I never have to go down that route. Yeah. But you, you just know the presence, he, he's got it, he, yeah. he can win you a case. Like, yeah. See, when you have to go through all that then, and then how do you put, how do you find balance in your life with trying to do Netflix and books and work and try to... Very, very difficult. Um, it's becoming much, much harder. I, I, I've got to make, not a choice. I've got to, I, I do badly need to change how I do things a little bit. I need to find more time for more things. I mean, I was saying to you earlier, I put about a stone on since I started my case that I've been doing in Reading for two, for two and a half months, <clears throat> simply because when I get back from court, if I had time to go into, a, I've got a little gym in the house, I just don't have time to even go in it because I'll come back and I'll have book things to do and I'll have interviews to do and I'll have law things to do as well. And I've got a, I've got a four year old son that I like to put to bed and, and they've got people phoning me up. and. At the moment, it never ends. At the moment, it doesn't stop. I, I do need to find more of a balance. The, <clears throat> I at least recognise that I don't have one. And I think recognising that I don't have one is hopefully the first step towards rectifying that. But um, but I've recognised that for about 18 months. So and I've done nothing about it. Uh, the barristers have anything in place to go and speak to someone after a big court case or when you see no. bad images? You can. You, you do sort of in your chambers. Barristers all work in chambers. They're all self-employed but a Chambers is a collective, and, and it's nice to have one. I don't have one, I do have a Chambers, but it's a Chambers of me, because when I, when I stepped away to, to set my, new, my sort of thing up, along with my mates, we, we set up together, we helped ourselves, I helped him set up a law firm, he helped me set up the Chambers, and we are fairly symbiotic. Um, you know, we work out the same office, we have the same admin staff. It, it's, it's still separate, but it's very close, and that is where I get my support, I think. If I need the support, I'll, I'll speak to him. Um, or I'll speak to a couple of mates who are at the bar. But it is definitely better when you are in chambers because there's a, there's a lot more people there. So if you've got a problem, that if you've seen something that this guy hasn't seen, then that guy will have done. What I will say is that even this very suggestion or thought of that is very new. <clears throat> it kind of demonstrates a, a different world. Well-being didn't even feature back in the day so when i saw those horrible pictures and went off and drank myself into a stupor for two days there was no well-being then there was no <clears throat> sit down and talk about it and it does to a certain extent i do kind of think you're in this job get a thicker skin you know, but at the same time i suppose you know that's an old it's an old way of thinking of things and maybe the world is healthier now who knows uh, I'm not sure it is. I'm uh, not sure it's better. I like the old school way of thinking. Just listen, mm -hmm. slap behind the head. Get fucking yeah. on with it. Like, because the thing is about mental health and stuff, well, I'm a big ambassador for mental health, but now I'm looking at it as <clears throat> there's more people speaking out about it, but there's more people suicidal. Yeah. So is it really working? Is it a case I just pull up the fucking big boy pants and get on with it? I understand if you've got problems, speak out. Yeah. But don't just keep living there. The, the slogan we've got now, it's okay not to be okay. I get it. Mm. But it's not okay to fucking live there. 
I agree. Because life has got to go on. There's got to come a stage where you've got to pull the reins in and go, wait a minute, I need to make changes. Like you were saying, you put on a stone. I put on yeah. a stone and a half. I know what needs to be yeah. done. I know what eating shit makes me feel bad. Yeah. I do it. Only person I've got to blame. And I know people's got a lot of more more in-depth issues in life and we've all got problems, but it comes a stage where you need to go, okay, listen, I need to make changes. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at the world now and think, it, let's look at the, the, the plus size stuff at the moment because we're talking about weight. The plus size stuff, oh, this is fat is beautiful. This is, no, it's not. It's unhealthy. I can say that. I'm 18 and a half stone. I shouldn't be. So I can say at the moment, I'm free to say fat is not beautiful, fat is not healthy, and you shouldn't be fat if you can avoid it. But we're not allowed to say that anymore. We've now got to say, well, I know you can't just have people in good shape on, on in their underwear on a thing. You have to have everyone. Why? Yeah, at the same time, yes, we have to understand that we can't all look like Thor. And actually, Thor can't look like Thor unless he has not eaten for three days, not drunk any water, and then pumped himself up for five hours before that 30-second scene. That's, not, that's unrealistic as well. But normality, we do need to be in the middle. And that is, that's just one example, I think, of, of, of the way the world is going a little bit wrong. We're all, it isn't all, all okay. And as you say about mental health, it isn't okay to not be okay. It's okay to recognize you're not okay and to do something about it. It's not okay, as you say, to not be okay and to live there and to be there forever. And as always, a lot of people jump on it. I remember when I was first starting, ADHD was the new thing. Everyone had ADHD. Five years later, everyone uh, was on the, uh, what's, what's the, the, not autistic, but the one next to it, the, um, the uh, why can't I remember that word? Yourself. That's that's extremely, um, Asperger's. Asperger's. On the, everyone was on the Asperger's scale suddenly, everyone. And you just think, well, where has this come from? The people jump on things, people jump on things, people look for excuses, people look for reasons quite often because they haven't achieved the thing they wanted to achieve and they can't just if I lost a boxing match I lost a boxing match and you're not going to get me saying oh you know you're not going to get me saying like Jake Paul suddenly well I had a really bad camp and I had this I, lost, I had the boxing match I lost I had a wet dream match. yeah oh my god <laughs> you, lose, you lose a boxing match you lose a boxing match you, you, you would try and achieve something I've got an excuse for why this didn't do great the yeah, reality is it just didn't do great and if it hadn't done, if that hadn't done great, not in lockdown, I would not have sat here and looked for a different excuse. But I said, yeah, that one could have done better. Shame, because I liked it. And it's simple as that. And I think we do live in a world in which there has to be, they would say, a reason for everything. I would say an excuse for everything. Yeah. See, when a lot of the court cases in America get filmed, they go live. Mm. I think the Johnny Depp, was that in the UK? <laughs> he did too. But there was one in the High Court in the UK that wasn't filmed. Yep. Um, the one in America was filmed. So why yeah. don't they film ones here? Uh, they do in Scotland now. They do in Scotland, they do in yeah, Scotland but England. Um, we're starting to film some sentences, which I agree with, because if you if you look at the reporting of sentences, they're never reported properly. And so you get all the outrage and all the, and I think that's done intentionally. You get all the outrage, it gives us a news story for a couple of days, but it's always bullshit. You know, it's always absolute rubbish. There's so many factors missing from the reports that you will be outraged and you'll think this is amazing. Uh, how has this happened? This is incredibly terrible. Whereas actually, when you listen to the entire sentence, you see the judge explain why they're getting that sentence. And judges are not often wrong with sentences, especially these days, because sentences are now very strictly set, set out in guidance from the government. Um, in terms of beyond that, I don't know the answer. I, I, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable being filmed. I probably would be comfortable being filmed because I'm, I'm much more used to it than other barristers. Yeah. But I still think it would put me off a bit. And I think there's some people it would put off incredibly. But much more to the point, I think there's a lot of witnesses will be put off. Do you feel a lot of trial by media? And I know there's a kid in Scotland, Luke Mitchell, when they were going through the murder trial, the kid's innocent. Like, he's done two polygraph tests, him and his mum, all the evidence against him. There was no DNA. There was a lot of stuff. They've done a Channel 5 documentary. I've done mm. a four-part series on him. I ain't a barrister. I ain't a lawyer. But with all the evidence, it was the kid, I believe, is innocent. Um, obviously, polygraph tests don't. Yeah. We get that. But him and his mum both passed. This kid can get released if it admits his guilt. Sorry, I've hit your thing. That's okay. <laughs> he can get released if it admits his guilt. But he still stayed in. He was he apparently killed a 14 year old girl he was 15 at the time but the papers fucking 
killed him he says it was this it was that relationships with his mum music he listened to he had knives that, that total trial by media do you find the media has a big part on pushing cases I think that they that they're normally quite good they're normally quite good with what they have to do and the rules that they have to follow but I do think yeah I, I think there's it's unavoidable you tell a jury at the outset of the case do not google this case I don't I mean we, we and we have to approach the law we have to approach the court system with the belief that the jury are doing what we ask but do they is it likely that I've just finished a two and a half month case with some some notable names coming up in the case is it likely that the jury when they heard those names didn't google them i just i just don't believe it i've got no evidence that it's happening but i just don't believe it because i know i know the temptation would be there for me and but those are bastards it, it's, it's, it's human nature yeah, it's an instinct. And, and but we have to accept that they follow the directions otherwise the whole system falls down yeah. um but yeah i do i do believe whilst most whilst most traditional media are very good at following the rules some of them aren't um and social media is a disaster for it because people just say whatever they want and it's impossible to police it it's impossible to police it what makes a good barrister um there is no proper answer to that question uh, because there are very good barristers who are so different to other very good barristers. I, th th there's two, there's generally two types of barrister, but then there are subdivisions of those two. But you've generally got a flair barrister or a prep barrister. And I'm very much in the, in the flair side. I've got friends that I think are superb who are in the prep side. And I couldn't do what they do. They are better barrister. They are a better barrister than me at what they do. And I'm better than them at what I do. And, and it's hard to say which one's more valuable. So it's really very, very difficult to say. But I would say someone who takes their, someone who, someone who absolutely takes their job seriously, no matter how much fun you might have doing it, and no matter how much humor you might bring to the, to the table. And ultimately, you've got to take what you do seriously. I would, I think probably if I'm going to give a single answer today, it would be a sense of justice. There's got to be a sense of justice, whatever side you're on. A prosecutor should not be seeking a conviction at all costs. A prosecutor is there to seek, and this is why I don't prosecute. I stopped prosecuting when I was being <clears throat> pushed by the CPS to do things that I didn't feel were in the public interest. Um, a prosecutor should not be seeking a conviction. They should be seeking the right result because a, a conviction isn't always the right result. If the man is innocent, the, or the woman is innocent, they should be acquitted. And a prosecutor should not be seeking that at all costs. And if they've got a sense of justice, they won't. A defence barrister should have a sense of justice. It should be, well, this is wrong, that's been done. And particularly when you're defending, because it stops being necessarily about the guilt or innocence of the person and starts becoming about the process that was followed. You know, whether or not it looks like this person might have done it, why did you do that to a police officer? Why, why to a police officer was this done? Why was that done? Why? to actually look at the process that was going through because ultimately they've, what the police have done, or what the CPS have done, have created the picture that is making this person look guilty. But did the thing, were, were the things that they did right? Were the, the things that constitute this picture correct? Because actually if they weren't and you take bits away because they were wrong, then the picture becomes much less compelling and much less clear. And so I think for both sides, it's a sense of justice. Yeah. Just before we finish up on, brother, your relationship with Alfie Best Senior, love him to bits, man. It's unbelievable what he's achieved. How did that relationship come about? Um, we've, just, we've just known each other for a very, very long time. Um, I'm, I'm first met Alfie, but I think we were, we were both relatively skint when I first met Alfie. And now, <laughs> Change this. Yeah, now I, 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 I live in a quite a nice house in Buckinghamshire, <laughs> and he, he lives wherever the hell he wants. <laughs> yeah, it's phenomenal. Well, the last questions, well, two questions. The pros and cons of being a barrister. What's the positives of being a barrister? Positive of being a barrister is no two days are the same. Um, it's an incredibly important job. Uh, it's a job that I'm incredibly privileged to do. Um, and if you're doing it to the right level, it's it's interesting as as it could possibly be. You're doing something that matters, and you're being in, you're interested in doing it. What's the negatives? Negatives are <clears throat> negatives that don't affect me anymore. Um, I have to, uh, the ones that affect me, the hours. The hours are extraordinary. Um, you need a very, very understanding family. 
the negatives overall, unfortunately, for those who are doing legal aid and legal aid only, is that even with the government changes, they're earning minimum wage. Um, the money they are paying young barristers is so poor that there are no longer any decent young barristers. Nobody with any talent wants to come to this profession. So where are our future KCs, QCs, KCs? Where are our future judges? Where is the future? Where are our future senior barristers? God knows. Yeah. Tony, would you like to finish up on anything? Um, no, I think, I, think, I think we've covered quite a lot. And where can people get your books again? Uh, Anyway, Amazon, uh, WH Smith, Waterstones, any independent bookstore. As I say, they're, they're, they're generally available. Um, hopefully they're enjoyable. Hopefully when someone buys one, they'll buy the rest. Yeah, Tony, listen, absolute pleasure. You do James. 400 interviews, mate. You're my first barrister. It's good to get an <laughs> understanding of that life, mate, what it's all about, what you go through. And yeah, just the kind of, it's a mad fucking life, but fair play to you. Wishing nothing but success for the future. Thank you very much. Take care. Cheers. Thank you.